I'm now honored to uh, just hand over the microphone to Carl Robigo. That's it, Carl. That's all you get. <laughs> We've been hanging out with Carl. We've been hanging out with Carl since Wednesday, and uh, just a fountain of information. And I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. <laughs> Thanks.
we weren't just sitting idly by for 20 years, right? We've been doing an awful lot of stuff to support the commercialization of solar and wind and other clean energy opportunities. Am I too loud? <coughs> Good, okay. Yeah, and I didn't want to pop, so I don't um, And oftentimes I'm so loud that everybody can hear me anyway. How's this? Is it working? Or Good, all right. So, um, I got to thinking about that. It was like if we didn't succeed in commercializing clean energy and sort of getting the business within these 20 years, what the heck were we doing? And I don't know what all you were doing, but I have still enough memory to remember some of the things I was doing, and I realized that some of these things, especially I think about people like Michael Bickerman and Dan and stuff, is that actually I was doing some of this stuff with some of you. So I, want to, I just want to quickly run through just a short list, and I'm just not without talking about them at all, just a list of the things that I can remember being involved in on the road to clean energy sort of commercialization and business success over the last 20 years. With the point to be made, not to brag about what I'm doing, but how complex and rich the landscape has to be in order to accomplish the success. So, ready? Okay. It's a host of things. Mine extension policies, integrated resource planning laws and rules, public participation workshops, charrettes and deliberative polls, university lectures, or big booths and speeches, many, many speeches, research and development programs, university partnerships, conferences, collaborative work groups, public education and analysis projects, solar for schools, avian impact studies, uh, technology demonstration projects, green power products, international partnerships, building codes and permitting reform, tax policy reform, distribution system modeling analysis, market <coughs> development in rural areas, worker training and certification, standard setting, competitive procurements, regulatory interventions, law writing and passing, scores of media interviews, and even books that have been written during this time. Of late, I've even got to participate not just in seminars, but in webinars and even a solar MOOC, <coughs> which I think is massively online open to community, but I don't know. <laughs> so, I left a number of things out, but I just wanted to run through that really fast. Because like I said, a lot of you people have been working on similar things. Some of you have probably been working on more things over the last 20 years as part of our supporting effort to commercialize this stuff. But the industry has been doing its share. The scholars have been setting up their supply chains. All of this has happened. We still have some more work to do. So um, that makes me remember something else from almost 20 years ago when I was first at DOE. And we were trying to explain why we were willing to spend $360 million of taxpayer money on renewable energy R&D and a little bit of deployment, although it was, you know, you had to be careful. We used to talk about how it took 17 years just to commercialize the zip. Okay? So the zip, right? I mean, can you imagine a more compelling technology in the world? <laughs> Guys, you know? <laughs> the and then I thought, well, maybe the button lobby was concerned about the <laughs> disruptive influence in this death spiral. Um, and then I also realized that somebody probably realized that their pants come off a lot faster with a zipper, so they probably thought it was a milestone on the road to global immodesty. Or something. Okay, I, I digress. My point, my point is that it takes an awful lot to commercialize something, even the good stuff, even the stuff that makes more sense. And it takes a lot of work, but that hasn't left us with nothing. Because all of that work and all of that success and all that supply chain development has left us and put us in the position of having a pretty damn good foundation for what we have to accomplish and what we have to finish. It's not, um, it, it, it's appropriate that the sort of the story for this conference is we mean business. It's not like we're starting business or we mean to have a business. We mean business. And that's where this stuff can go. Um, I think that with the record and even in spite of sort of the failure of not fully commercializing all the clean energy technologies we should have by now, we are better positioned than many others, even in the rest of the globe, for accomplishing the success that we all dream of. I think our path to successful commercialization is shorter, for example, than Germany, or much of Europe. In spite of all the wonders of their FIDs and things like that, because we haven't installed other systems, because we use tax-based policy more than we use subsidy-based subsidy policy at the federal level, because of just, because people have had it rough and starved and they learned to be lean and mean and successful and they've dealt with, you know, jerky utilities as well as great utilities and, and, and insensitive policymakers as well as supportive policymakers, but they've lived in a dynamic environment where <coughs> I think you and generally the industry is better positioned to just finish it, 
to mean business and go ahead. So the main point I want to talk to you about today is just simply this. That with all that has happened and with all that we've done, with all that is going on around us today, this is the moment. This is the, the time for you to revitalize your efforts, for you to replace your commitment, for you to rechallenge yourselves to realizing the vision that we have all have really shared directly or indirectly for as much as the last 20 or more years in our lives. To accomplish a fundamental transformation in the way we make and use energy and the way we interact with our environment, our society, our businesses, and our government agencies. This is the time we've been preparing for. This is our moment. So what do we got to do? Well, let me pause by telling you that whatever is going on here, I want to tell you somebody who works around the country, and I know Dan and others who work in other states and other countries can tell you, is go, this is going on in a lot of places. Some places they're taking steps backwards, some places we're not taking steps at all and just treading water, and some steps, places we're taking kind of steps forward. But generally there's a lot of stuff going on. And if you look at some of the big statistics at the end of the year, last year OPAR had a great list, um, you know, but everybody else had their top 10, their top 15, their top 9, whatever it was out there. There's some pretty interesting statements out there. You start with the fact that we're still wasting 60% of all the input energy into our energy system meaning we're liquidating the natural capital on which all of our prosperity and future welfare is dependent. We haven't learned that, but we've also put record amounts of budgets in into utility company demand response programs. One out of every four cars today is an electric or a plug-in or a hybrid vehicle. That auto industry is transforming. I mean, sorry, one out of 25. One out of 25. One out of 25 is a lot. Once every four minutes, the solar system is being installed, just not in Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the legislators mentioned the, that we got the Tea Party sitting now at the Sierra Club in Georgia. I'll just give you my little colloquial summary of this. Uh, I've told people this before. It's like the prep and the goth sneaking off together <laughs> behind the gym to smoke cigarettes and suck face. <laughs> having, having worked in Georgia, I can tell you, nobody there much thinks anything real is going to come of this, but you just can't take your eyes off it. <laughs> it's, just, it's so fascinating. We have Walmart pledging to 100% renewable energy. Not when, but at some point, they're, at least they're going to do it. We have the military leading the way on smart grid and energy security and clean energy and talk using terms like the fully burdened cost of the energy associated with procurement and technology for tanks and things like that. In the individual state, we've got some pretty exciting stuff. California has run out of room in its California initiative and run out of room in its traditional net metering. And the legislature, the legislature, the assembly passed a quick bill to say we've got to come up with a permanent solution, 83.7. Within the next two years, and I think the staff is working on it already. I mentioned Georgia. Not only did we have the commission ordering 525 megawatts of solar as part of the IRP proceeding, but I can tell you that that 525 megawatts also closely corresponds with the number of megawatts that Georgia Power is retiring of coal capacity. Is it coincidence? For which they wanted guaranteed rate recovery for their for their decommission costs, so they could move to more affordable gas. Um, and that the, many in the company expect that at least 400 of that megawatts <coughs> is going to be fulfilled by the new Southern Company Renewables of the day. So it's even more complicated than just the Green Tea Party thing. Uh, and the utility still proposed a solar surcharge in their last rate case, which we managed to do. So, Complicated, interesting stories you know about your neighbor in Minnesota, not just the value of solar tariff and solar standard and other things, but also this great, interesting ALJ decision that came out the Excel decision. Uh, the Excel Resource Procurement uh, case just a couple of weeks ago. A fascinating and important decision about thinking ahead and thinking comprehensively about the resources that are available, and not just defaulting to a simplistic, let's do it like we've always done in the cost calculation. Uh, Arizona, settling a feud, 
with what's probably, arguably, an illegal 70 cents per kilowatt charge, completely unsubstantiated and not consistent with any purpose requirements that these unqualified facilities be tied to metered performance. But we've got them out of the fight for now and other places to go. I heard a commissioner on a webinar say 20% of the rooftops that could have solar in Hawaii now have them, the residential rooftops. And then when asked what does it cost, he said, oh, that's about 1% of the cost of electricity. So integration, we've got some place to go, but a good reason to be comfortable. Italy did 7% solar last year. Iowa just announced a comprehensive look at distributed energy resources. You guys should watch and participate with that neighbor's activity uh, to the extent you can learn from them. If nothing else, just photocopy the comments. It's going to be really valuable. And I won't go into what's going on in Michigan, North Carolina, Colorado, South Carolina, TV, in Texas, Vermont, Oregon, Florida, Louisiana, and others that I'm tracking in terms of exciting work that's going on in this. What does it all point to? It points to that word that I just said, transformation. In my experience, the word transformation dates back to the Department of Defense. It's the word that the Department of Defense acquired for what we had to do to our military capability after we came out of Vietnam. We were organized, logistically, operationally, strategically, all wrong for what we were facing in the world around us. And so people, some pretty brilliant people like Rumsfeld and Petraeus and others realized that our Department of Defense establishment had to transform. We just weren't facing the world and the threats that we thought we would be facing and that we had faced in the past. And we needed a new kind of military readiness. The same applies to the utility sector today. And I guarantee you, if you scratch most professional utility people, they will tell you they agree. They're just trying to figure out a way to do it. So let me talk about transformation and put it in a slightly different <coughs> way. My favorite joke that was never told is a joke to Neil Armstrong who never actually said on the way to the moon, I hope the lowest bidder didn't get the contract. <laughs> <laughs> and it's my favorite joke. I wish you'd say it. <laughs> the point, of course, is that if you are hurtling through space on a voyage to an unknown and an uncertain future, you really, really need a quality environment and quality infrastructure services. I mean, that's the point of that joke. And when it comes to electricity, though it was not always so, electricity is a need that we have in society today. Right? We need it all around the world. The problem is that the need is meeting challenges that are different. As somebody mentioned, our business model is 100 years old. Our energy policy is 100 years old. Now, you'll often hear politicians say, what we need is an energy policy. And I just kind of, I kind of bristle. We've had an energy policy in this country for 100 years. It's the same energy policy, it's the same policy that we have for education, and for housing, <coughs> and for food, and for transportation. You see, we want electricity as cheap as we can get. That's our policy. We want electricity as cheap as we can get it, no matter what it costs. <laughs> The trouble is, we can't afford cheap energy anymore. <laughs> we can't afford to go with the lowest bid. We have an electricity system that its current incarnation dates back to the 20th century before, when, that was built and designed with incentives that were all about electrification of cities, and monopoly franchises, in order to do efficient procurement of power plants, that the bigger you made them, the more efficient they got. It was a good deal because a lot of private capital got invested, a lot of infrastructure got built, great efficiency was brought to it, and benefits were received by everyone because the more people we connected to the grid, the more benefits we got. They call it today, like the, the modern people call it network effects. In the old days, in the economists used to call it universality. But it got better for everyone the more you used and the more you did and the more you connected. It was a very good deal. It was particularly addictive for commissioners. Because all you had to do was approve a new power plant and rates would go down. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be a public utility commission? The utility wants to build another power plant. Hey! <laughs> Good. I rate announced a rate reduction. We're building a new power plant. It worked for everyone. It worked for a while. It was pleasantly addictive. 
at least until we learned, for example, that pollution from Appalachia could poison streams in Maine, that outages in Florida could shut down the southeast United States, and that our unchecked carbon emissions would change weather around the world. It worked, that is, until it stopped working. We've exhausted the economies of plant scale that drove our business model and our utility industry. And most of us are also, even worse, not satisfied with the service that we get and the cost we bear from the large central station model. We don't want our present comfort to come at the expense of our children's future or their children's future. We expect our government officials to work for us and to help us be the angels of our better selves. We expect our regulators to be the substitute for competition if utilities are going to enjoy the monopoly franchise. We can't afford cheap energy or its consequences. We can't afford things like global climate change, infinite and perpetual rate increases for service, ethical change, anti-innovation, and opposition to customer empowerment. We just can't afford our cheap energy and it's too damn expensive. <laughs> So communities around this country are starting to respond to this, and groups, people are starting to respond to this, and they're saying this utility industry has to change. We want smarter, cleaner, more affordable energy services. We want empowering distributed energy services, things that enable us to do more things for ourselves. We want solar on our rooftops, we want efficient appliances, we want building smart grids, smart building smart grids, local green jobs, we want programs tailored for the less fortunate among us. We want it today, and we want it tomorrow. We want sustainable energy. That's what we want from this utility industry that we've invested so much in. And we want leaders who will figure out how to make it happen, and not just make excuses for not doing it. It's a fraught moment right now. The distributed stuff is so, well, distributed. This competitive stuff is so market-based. So much of it is not under utility control, so value-based instead of price-based, so long-term smart and so short-term well new. But still, the industry must transform. The old business model will not bring us what we want. The business model will not allow us, as I've said in other places, it will not allow for your dreams of cleaner air sooner, of climate responsibility sooner, of water security and energy security sooner. The business model will not let you dream of all the dreams you have for your children and your grandchildren, for your communities, for your state, and for our nation and the world. We need to change it. So, I went to somebody great from Wisconsin, and I said, what is he have to say? And he said, the problem is that by and large, our present problem is one of attitudes and implements. We are remodeling a palace, the Alhambra, with a steam shovel. We're proud of the, of, of the yardage. We'll hardly relinquish the shovel, which after all has many good points, but we're in need of gentler and more objective criteria for its successful use. I would argue that's where we are with the utility industry today. We don't want to give away what we've invested in, but it needs to transform. And our regulators and our legislators have a duty not to wait for us to tell them what to do, but also to step up and start leading as well. Because we need to transform this, so we're not going to put the problem of change. So, what do we work on? Well, I'll give you two quick dimensions of things that we need to work on, I think, to move forward. The first is that we need to work towards mainstream market success. So I looked out there at the end of the year. Shale Khan, a VP of research at GTM Energy, has a list of five things, four things that are indicators of mainstream, of mainstream <coughs> market success. We have offered them for solar, they apply to all of clean energy. Number one, it should be a primary, so primary source of new electricity capacity. You saw in the presentation of the guy from one of the wires um, that it is a major source of new capacity nationwide, just not in Wisconsin. That's what you need for mainstream markets for clean energy here. Not just year over year growth, because that falls victim to the law of small numbers. If you have one kilowatt and have one more, it's a 100% increase. Not quite success, all right? Second, it needs to be cost effective without reliance on fickle incentives. Truth is, we have to try to get away from incentives. It's, public policy is on the side of it, but that doesn't mean we get rid of the incentives and do nothing. It also doesn't mean that cost effective means price only. 
we need to focus on value. So let the incentives we have do their work in a stable market environment. Don't switch them every time we ideologically switch our political leadership. Let them work for several years. An example I have from Austin is in six years of continuous policy work just to keep our local solar market going. We took the number of installers from 4 to 40, and the number of employees from about 40 to about 600 working for our, for our market. Drop the price of solar by over half during that time. It can be done. Uh, so, we, if we're having incentives, we need ways to work out of them, but we need to do it in the right way. <coughs> the third indicator of mainstream is the utilities in their war on solar. Right? And there is some utilities who are embarked on that war, and their resistance to resources that they don't fully control. Clean energy advocates, like yourselves, need to invest in communicating the value of these resources and give them some reason to be supported. Do it directly through groups like Renew, but also, and to utilities, policymakers, regulators, the business community, and the public. Likewise, utilities need to rearrange their mental approach. Need to learn a little bit more about what customers want and what things are worth. Fourth, clean energy must be financing. That means that real money has to be reported. That means stable demand and stable market policies to keep the organized supply chain efficiency as we move ahead. So those are the four dimensions of mainstream markets, and that's the things I think that we need to shoot for if we really do mean business. But the other sort of trajectory against it is sort of some how we work things. So I've, I've grouped these into a bunch of C's. Let me run through them very quickly. First, we need to collaborate right now even more than we compete. It's a fundamental rule of ecology that in times of resource constraint, cooperation is the dominant survival and growth skill. There will be plenty of time for cutthroat competition later when the market is established, but this is the time when the community needs to try to come together with as much of a common voice as it possibly can. I know that utility and regulatory officials would appreciate it. Yeah. Second, we need to communicate and convince. Somebody mentioned education earlier. This is definitely a part of it. Much of the public doesn't know how good this stuff is. They don't understand it. They fear it won't work. You're going to have to invest in that. Do it through organized channels like Renew and other groups, but you're going to have to do it. Don't hide your good things under a bushel basket. Don't expect customers to be a path to your door. Invest in communication. Invest in convincing people about the good stuff. Third, construct and coalesce around ecosystems, not individual components. Ecosystems are characterized by diversity in which every person <coughs> contributes and the sum is greater than, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Ecosystems are dynamic and flexible. They will give you robustness in the face of the challenges that you have ahead. Large, rigid bureaucracies, whether government or corporate, are not what we need right now. We need adaptability. Finally, copy when appropriate and create a new when necessary. Some of these states, yes, even California, have things for you to learn. Maybe it's things you should copy, maybe it's things you shouldn't, but copy the good things and discard the dumb things and have the wisdom to know the difference and the courage to choose on the basis of market success. That's what you've got to do. Finally, convene around a vision. Somebody mentioned that earlier on. Uh, you just have to have a vision with all the crazy stuff that's happened over the last 20 years and is likely to happen over the next 20 years. If you don't have a vision to sustain you, then you could lose your way. Especially, as the old joke goes, when you're up your ass in alligators, it's hard to remember that the original goal was to drain the swamp. <laughs> Not a good environmentalist metaphor. <laughs> Maybe better than how you need a hippopotamus sandwich, but at the beginning, you know, you get my point. Right? You're going to lose track of the big picture if you don't have a big picture to keep track of. More on that as I close in just a minute. But a couple of other key points regarding policy things that I've heard discussed specifically. First rule, follow the money. In the electric utility industry, the money comes from the sales of commodity and is measured by how much the utility has in capital assets. That's what I talked about the big power plant model. In the transformed utility world, success comes from the provision of services and the addition of value delivery of value. To address this, we have to have some big ideas. Decoupling profitability from sales is one of them. Second, we have to reward performance, not just power plant building. 
Second, play to your strengths. Be mammals, not dinosaurs. I have been saying that for 20 some years. <laughs> right? The goal here is not to make yourself like dinosaurs to compete with dinosaurs. The goal is to remember that you are mammals. You're quick. You're 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 adaptable. You're resilient. You you evolve quickly. You learn. That's what you have to do. That's the real significance of that Minnesota decision. Right? I mean, you look at what Geronimo did in their proposal in that, in that case. They didn't come in and say, we're going to try to offer a giant power plant scale solar project. We're going to offer 100 megawatts at 10 to 20 different installations and 2 to 10 megawatts at a time. And then the judge was compelled to realize that they were saving transmission costs and they were improving reliability by the siting choices that could be made. They played the mammal game in the face of the dinosaurs. And if that decision stands up, that's one of the things I think will be important about that. So play to your strengths. Be mammals. Don't be dinosaurs. The next two I've already mentioned. Number one, focus on value, not on price. Remember, there are only two things that utility people don't know. What anything's worth and what anyone wants. <laughs> so, you have to help them understand what things are worth. That's the value of solar storage. That was why, that was the genesis of why I created the value of solar in Austin and used our value of solar analysis in order to drive a retail rate that would get us past the problems of net metering. We wanted to know what is the true indifference price at which the utility could make the solar kilowatt hour or the customer could make the solar kilowatt hour. Because if you're going to get a solar kilowatt hour, there's a point in which care which one has. That's all we were trying to do with the value of solar. And we couldn't get there with traditional approaches. We had to know the value in order to get there. That's, that's that whole story. By the way, a little side thing on policy. The avoided cost, me avoided cost methodologies that sort of influence our industry and the selection of resources are broken, they're out of date, and they need updating. We have better tools. We have better methodologies. Nationwide and state by state, we need to relook at the 1978 formulations about how we use peaker methodologies to evaluate everything but peakers that we seem to be acquiring today and take a fundamental look at the value of resources and um, We need to make some adjustments. So that's focus on value and then focus on empowering customers. And what I really like about the way we're in Wisconsin phrase this morning is that they focus on empowering customers by focusing on bringing in third-party innovation. Because third parties are focused on empowering customers. They're saying if the utility won't, somebody will. I'm not saying we need to have, you know, competition head-to-head. -head. I think utilities have a lot to learn by bringing a third party into the conversation. And that's the way you probably ought to do it. Challenge the utility and the regulators to learn a few new tricks from some new voices who can be part of the conversation and make sure the public gets to voice what they want as we go along. Think boldly and stand behind your big ideas like no new fossil fuel plants. I think that's a great case. The technology is there, as we've heard. All you have to do is keep repeating it and believe in it. And everybody else will want to join you as well. Work the details like fixing interconnection and net metering. Fund Renew to do all their important work. Okay, now I'm paying attention. <laughs> you know what I mean? Fund Renew. Uh, there's a lot of us out there ready to help. I sit on the board of IREC. We're eager to help. Uh, we're eager to look for places where we can maintain forward progress. And then stay the course and keep reaching. You're right. Your RPS standard is woefully out of date. Everybody else is laughing. You should be reaching higher and further you can. The technology has improved. The opportunity has improved. The understanding of that has improved. Keep going forward. And like I said to the a few minutes ago, Bubble work in all the divisions. So my last story. 20 years ago when I did become a public utility commissioner, I also had a chance to create this thing called the Sustainable Energy Development Council. Working with elected officials, utility officials, advocates, <coughs> and got the support of Ann Richards, Governor Ann Richards, and she signed an executive order. And the very first thing we did, and our mission of the Sustainable Energy Development Council was, well, let me tell you what it was in response to. It was in response to the fact that Texas had just become a net energy import. The, the state of the movie Giant, the place where they had bumper stickers that said Drive 75 and Freeze a Yankee, had become a net energy importer in 1992. 
And we said, we think we can run this state on sustainable energy resources. If we have a little money, we can create a plan that will allow us to do it. We wrote that plan, and it was backed by a vision statement that I'm going to share. Now, I'll tell you the end of the story. George Bush got elected. He beat out all the remaining funding for it. Uh, he went forward with winning a different one, but not a lot of it. So did Governor Terry, by the way. I mean, now we're over 10,000 megawatts of wind in Texas and another 8,000 on the books for development. So um, just chose a different path. But what has sustained me personally, and I know talking to some of the guys that I worked with 20 years ago on that stuff, was that vision statement that we adopted. Our vision statement was, we envision a Texas responsibly powered by its sustainable energy resource base and serving as a model to others in equitable prosperity, environmental health, advanced technology, innovative government, and respect for future generations. That was our vision statement. And I've looked back at it, as I've said, many times. And things got weird and went off track. I remembered what I was working for and tried to hold to that to that line and, and make sure that I was honoring that vision statement that I had adopted for myself and hope my state would adopt for itself as well. Again, I think you're going to need a vision statement, something that you can agree on. I think you should come back and reconvene around a draft vision statement as a Congress of people who care about this and adopt it and repeat it and spread it. And maybe even you can use some of these words. So I'll say them again. Can you imagine a Wisconsin that is responsibly powered by a sustainable energy resource base and that serves as a model to others in equitable prosperity, environmental <coughs> health, advanced technology, innovative government, and respect for future generations? I think you can get filled up another room this size with people who join you behind an idea like that. I'll offer it to you as a starting place. I encourage you to find your own voice in this and to repeat it and to share it and to cherish your victories and to work through your defeats because what you're doing is probably the most important thing you've ever done. It certainly feels like that <coughs> for me. Thank you for your hospitality. Thanks to Renew. Thanks to Kelly for the logistics and all the staff. Thanks to every single one of you who are sitting still while I went through this talk. I wish you great success in the year ahead. I offer my assistance in any way I can. Um, I think doing value of solar and food would be a great idea. <laughs> Good luck in the year ahead and in all the years ahead. Thank you very much.
finance commission, which is called the CFTC. But anyway, work with them to get it identified as not being a swap, but instead, instead being a board and all these sophisticated definitions. Um, what it does is it makes it easy for people to overcome <coughs> a little bit of that information barrier that keeps them from making a decision. And allows it to be really, I think, in big by the military. The Air Force is one of the biggest users. Pepsi buys a billion for a lot of hours of green certified energy. Coles, Goldman Sachs, very big, big companies who are looking to green up their portfolio and want to do it through the purchase of Rex. As Michael said earlier on, you do it by buying them from anywhere. All we needed was a uniform standard around there. Um, it's built, the voluntary market has built more renewables than the mandatory market up until last year when the RPS has started climbing, you know, and they were kind of slow to start. But for the last 10, 15 years, it's the voluntary market that built pretty much all the renewables in there, uh, or at least the line of share. So that was our premise. That customers, that no matter what the standard is, you know, no matter what the minimum daily requirement is prescribed by the government, there'll be somebody who wants to take it more life. Somebody who wants to do a little bit more. Somebody who finds a healthy benefit in it. Uh, and I think it's been very successful. I worry for it because every time we talk about doing things like regulating carbon, we start thinking, oh, well, they won't need a voluntary market because we're going to set the standard and everything will be fine. And I think you guys are sort of testament to that, right? I mean, the RPS has been helpful, but can you imagine if that was the only opportunity you had? So in Wisconsin, there yeah. are thousands of people who are on green car for right. the utility, and yet we're not seeing a lot of renewable right. energy built in yeah. Wisconsin. So I'm suggesting that right. this is a vehicle in our regulated state of the that we're going to be able to break out right. a way that we can shift over to independent green car program. I, I think you're right. I'm a little perplexed as why there isn't more uptake here. I mean, the places where you don't see uptake on sort of national standards is places where they think they can get away with not with that. And I think that underestimates customers. You know, we all read the internet and watch TV. We know what's going on in other places. And these little indicators of quality can really help boost the program. They can actually help the utilities as well as, you know, sort of all the others. So I agree with you. I think, I mean, I think this is a, a big part of it. I think there have been some pretty exciting developments where people have done things like these that we heard about, right? We, local rec purchases from locally installed solar goes to feed into green power programs and customers get to express their preference for changing the way their electricity is made even if they can't put solar on the roof. I will add to that, by the way, a whole other category of things we're starting to look at that I haven't heard mentioned a lot, but a little bit, thank goodness is these community solar, shared solar, shared renewable. Um, maybe there's something because biogas guys, that's just a heck of a terrible story. In fact, there's leadership position eroding like this. It, that needs to be fixed. Maybe there's hope in aggregated demands that, you know, community. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So he said time for one more. Or, no. All right. I, there's more good things coming. Thanks again for the hospitality.